So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about mindsets. What, what goes up here when you're trying to, say, strive to be number one in the world at something? And I, I have a passion about, about this. Uh, I'm fascinated with performance. I'm fascinated with excellence. But I'm also a bit obsessed with what stops people, the, the very human experience. And, and having worked with um, top performers in, in ballet, in music, in sport, and certainly in business, what I've seen is that what stops really the great people on their not so good days is very human stuff. It can be anxiety, it can be depression, it can be fear, it can be a lot worse things. And so it's, it's actually trying to make sense of that mix of achieving for, you know, striving for the extraordinary, um, but also, you know, dealing with being very human. And in a sense, uh, psychology of excellence is not as much about how you be awesome, but how do you respond when things aren't so awesome? More about your bad days uh, than your good ones. So, um, oh, that's what that's for. On, there we go. Um, I know, I've had a couple of, uh, of attempts at the Olympic Games uh, in Sydney, um, 2000, Athens 2004. It was my dream to, to be an Olympic rower. Those are my teammates actually winning the gold in, uh, in, in Beijing and China. But both of my attempts ended in misery um, and injury. I, I didn't even get to go. And I missed out. And, and what, I, what I learned is I really had to, to figure out how to think differently. And that's probably the theme of today is how can we challenge ourselves to think differently? I think you've, had, you've been bombarded with you know, extraordinary information. I don't profess to, to know your industry inside and out, but I do understand that there's a fair bit of chaos and change going on, a lot of uncertainty. And thinking differently, the mindsets have become quite important. You know, I'd, um, I look at, I've done a little bit of research, and, and, and I think that um, you know, looking at where you have to think differently around the disruption, whether it's the demise of big budget TV, or whether it's you know, the Facebook ad exchange, the crazy speed of information, um, I love things like what, what Nike's done with the running app. You know, have you seen the Nike Plus? You know, how do you engage your marketplace? Not by advertising, but I guess it is kind of you know, brand awareness, but really engaging them in experience. And I, and I being a, an avid cyclist myself, um, you know, there's, a, there's a number of different apps out there that, that connect people, that really bring you know, uh, brand champions to the fore. But it's this mix of art and science, isn't it? How do you, how do you mix the... The, the data analysis, the information overload with the creatives and the, and the artists amongst you. When it comes to team, building team and performing at a high level in that environment, in that chaos, it does demand thinking differently. Um, and what I've, I've observed over the years of working with some of the top performers in their fields is that there's a formula for success. And if you've got your pens, I'd like to share it with you right now. There's, there's a formula. Um, so get ready. I'm going to tell you the secret. <laughs> I, I'm I'm Canadian, so w w I'm not funny. Like so, I'd, we're, <laughs> no, really, we're, we're not very funny. Like I, my wife's English, and she says I have no humor um, because people can't tell when I'm being serious or funny. So if, if you think you're sort of not really sure, like that's my attempt at being funny. Um, <laughs> So the formula for success is fairly simple. Number one, choose, choose, choose your goal. What, what, what do you want to achieve? So what, what does success look like? Define success. So it's choose. Then get in action or get busy doing the things that will get you there and persist at those things. So that's it. So choose, get busy, persist is the secret to success. Success is actually very simple as a concept. I think we all get this. We all know this. Um, success is simple. The problem is, we're, we're not. Human beings aren't. And um, we create all kinds of complexity, all kinds of interference. And, and a lot of it actually comes down to how we're designed. And that's where my background, I spent a, a few years in, in um, I think I was avoiding success or maybe avoiding failure, spent 11 and a half years in university studying some of this stuff. Um, and most of that complexity comes from within, how the brain is designed. And in particular, when it comes to high performance, we have to look at our instinctual brain, that thing that sends us very strong, compulsive feelings to respond, to do things. Because that part of the brain, it actually tries to avoid failure, but it also tries to avoid success under certain circumstances. So how does it work? 
Well, in a survival world, so let's, let's imagine now that we've stepped into survival world, we're back in caveman days, living in a jungle. Um, fear spikes when we face a threat. And that's how we're designed, it's meant to. So when you, you, you perceive that maybe there's a, a wild animal out there that wants to eat you for lunch, we get that rush of adrenaline, the hypothalamic, uh, pituitary adrenal axis, triggers, and we're, we get ready. Everyone knows this fight or flight response. You're ready for violent muscular action. It's, it's good to have that. Um, uh, I just moved back to Australia from Canada this year, and, and, and last summer when I was out, out the backyard, I heard a rustling in the bushes, and um, you know, a nice big black bear pops out. So violent muscular action in those circumstances is, is very good. The problem is in our modern world, and, and particularly in the business world, where do we really need that, that, that fear response? Because what it does is it, it creates an anxiety that takes us out of the game. You know, we're, there we go. Um, what do you do when you have feelings misfiring, telling you to do something, telling you to react, when you don't really need to react? That's confusing. But if that wasn't confusing enough, <laughs> the problem is, is that we also have feelings that take us out of achieving success. So when there's no fear, we're actually designed to take it easy. You see, success at the highest level is against our instincts. Where's, is, is Ben still in here? Did he, did he hang out? No, he didn't hang out. Um, ben could tell you a little bit about how abnormal high performance is, you know, how you'd have to push yourself to achieve those levels, to get out there in the snow and, and ride across Baffin Island. It's against your instincts. Why is high performance beyond mere survival against your instincts? Because if you lived in that survival world, if there's food in the cave and you're feeling safe, doing something that's not necessary for survival is a waste of energy. And wasting energy is a threat to your survival. So like, there's got a nice little circle here. We will avoid success when it's not about survival. I, I was watching the um, Iron Man in Cannes in June. It's a uh, Three and a half kilometer swim, followed by 180 kilometer bike ride, followed by a full marathon. The average person might get it done in about 12 or 14 hours. Any, anyone ever done Iron Man? No, just Ben. He's not here anymore. Crazy. You'd be about 20 strokes into the swim, and your body would be screaming at you to stop, because you know you've got 14 hours of pain in front of you. The only reason you would do that instinctually, without even having to be thinking about it, is if you're being chased by that saber-toothed tiger that wanted to eat you for lunch. We have built-in mechanisms from, that stop us from achieving success. So what that means is that it's completely normal to be lazy. The conservation of energy is in your instinctual brain. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your team members. We, we judge people when they don't put in extraordinary effort. I, I'd say, yeah, let's not judge them so harshly. Um, totally normal to be lazy. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> this is not what you expected, is it? <laughs> yes, it's normal, but it's also completely dysfunctional if you're trying to achieve high performance. So how do we make sense of all this stuff? Fear of failure, avoidance of success. This is, the problem is this stuff is functioning unconsciously in your brain. Now, we can make it more conscious, but we actually have to move out of it because we're not, we're not stuffed. We can, we can actually get on top of this, and the reason why is because nature gave us an upgrade to the survival brain, the limbic brain, we call it the neocortex. It's what distinguishes human beings from other animals on the planet. It's way bigger than the rest of them. And it gives us this extraordinary creative mind, this mind that can imagine and innovate and see possibility and actually override that feeling brain. So we have to leverage that thinking brain. And that's what mindsets are about. Mindsets come from the thinking brain. What are the mindsets that are actually going to develop success on your team and in your personal world? And that's what we're going to spend the rest of this time looking at. What are those mindsets? However, <laughs> um, there's a lot of mindset stuff doing the rounds. There's a lot of people that talk about mindsets. And I, I used to teach research methods um, in design, and, and one of the things that st stood out for me was this the statement that correlation does not equal causation. So if you hated stats, if you ever studied in university, you're going to hate that I even mentioned that. <laughs> but when it comes to mindsets, the myths are about there are mindsets that are correlated with success, but they're not necessarily the cause of it. So I'm going to throw up five challenges here of things that I see are myths, mindset myths that lead to success. And what I'd ask you to do is reflect on whether you hang on to these myths as truth, as causing success, whether they've been a challenge for you, or maybe whether you disagree with me. 
And then we're going to look at actually what are the antitheses to these mindsets? What are the, what are the principles? So the first mindset, <coughs> results first. Isn't that what the game, game is all about? Uh, certainly working in professional sport, and I've been in, uh, I've been in AFL now for, for 10 years, um, uh, been with Olympic athletes. Sport, it's all about results. It's whether you win or you lose on the weekend, win enough, play finals, win a premiership. Um, it's all about results. So how is this one a myth? I don't know. Blockbuster, they own the video market. <laughs> they have pretty good results. <laughs> How'd that go for them? Um, <laughs> Starbucks came into the Australian market with a template for extraordinarily successful results on a global scale. How'd that work for them, and particularly in, in Melbourne? Um, and I might ask you how has the legacy of positive results got in the way of effective or quick responses to disruption or change? I'm not saying results aren't important. I'm not saying that. They're the game. They're everything. But where do they become a distraction? I think there's a mindset that's key around this. In fact, if I go back to the, the football example, I got, um, I got hired in 2007 to work with the St. Kilda Football Club. Any Melbourneites? Or any Victorian people? You know what I'm talking about. It's religion down there, isn't it? Um, so you'd probably know who Ross Lyon is. Everyone else goes, who's that? Um, he was the, he was the uh, midfield coach at Sydney. They won a premiership with the Swans. And he got hired the Saints to turn their fortunes around that extremely talented list. And, uh, and he was going to help turn their fortunes around because they never quite got over the line. They never quite ended up in number one position. The problem was, um, and in sport, we're, we're very results driven. We're very results folks. We speak about results every, every week. It's we got to win this week or else. Then halfway through his first season, when we're mostly losing, you're left with or else. Where does the mind go when you're losing all the time and you're rating yourself by results? Well, we're not good enough. We're losers. It's actually quite depressing. It undermines motivation and effort, even when you keep striving to achieve that result. Every week, coach saying, we've got to win this one, and you lose. It's a pretty negative, deep, dark place to be. So let me tell you, the results first mindset, there's some challenges around it. Um, and we're going to come back to the, to the principles that back that up. Myth number two, talent wins the cup. I, I used to. Um, I used to do uh, a lot of assessment interview work for a, a few different HR companies um, back when I was first starting my career. And I remember um, we, we did assessment centers, and we interviewed this uh, executive for, for Levi's. And oh, I did the interviews. And on paper, resume looked amazing, perfect fit for the job, except that there was something missing. So the talent was all there. But for me in the interview, there was something about the motivational fit, the alignment of that, of that person, the desire for the job. <laughs> And I flagged that um, with the company and said, look, I, you know, I'd, I'd want to explore this more before you give them a job offer. And um, no, um, they hired him. They didn't, they didn't go further. They didn't go deeper. How, how long do you think he lasted in mean, that job? Three months. And he was, it was a rather costly experiment. And you know, in, in sport, we say, be careful not to be seduced by talent. We need talent on our roster, absolutely. But there's something else that comes first. And you, know, you, have to, you might ask yourself, if you're leading a team, running an organization, where have we sort of been seduced by the talent without looking at other elements that are important? And we're going to get to the principle on this one as well. <clears throat> Myth number three. No one likes failure. We talked a bit about the brain science of failure, how we try to avoid it. Um, and the best in the world, they don't, they don't fail too often. So shouldn't we, shouldn't we take on this attitude? You know, I'm not going to accept failure. I'm just going to march on. Isn't that, isn't that a good one? I think I've, we've heard it somewhere before. But like with the saints, if, if this is your core message, what happens when you are failing? What happens when you are suddenly cast into, into chaos? You see market share decreasing. You see the, the world slipping away from you. What do you do then if you've, if you've hung your hat on this mindset? Where has the attempt to avoid failure at all costs, cost you or your business and your personal life potentially. We've got to get our head wrapped around this one. Next myth, don't show any sign of weakness. Um, once again, in elite sport, there's been a, a culture of pretending to have that tough outer armor. I mean, and I think it works on, on, the, on the football field. 
So don't show your competitors. And I, and I, and I think, say in the business environment also, it's okay outwardly not to necessarily show weakness to competitors. Although isn't that changing? Isn't transparency and connecting with your consumer, showing vulnerability, showing your humanness, isn't that a, as a way of, of engaging? You see, in sport we've seen a, a shift in that culture, at least around the physical side of weakness, where um, 20 years ago, uh, probably even 10 years ago, and in, still in some locker rooms, a player was called weak or soft. If they didn't push through a broken jaw you know, or a torn hamstring. I mean, it, it's almost ridiculous. I, I did a PhD in overtraining and injury, and, um, and, I, and I talked to athletes whose coach basically sent them out with broken bones. So it was like, you know, be tough, suck it up. And then someone went, well, wait a minute. If all our players are injured, we're going to lose. Um, being open to vulnerability is, is, is pretty important. And, and when even something simple as creating a culture where saying I don't know is okay, if you've got people who work for you who aren't willing to say, I don't know, that's a, that's a killer of innovation, particularly in a chaotic market. So what weaknesses could you be afraid to confront in yourself or in your team that could be holding you back is a question I leave you with. Myth number five, the final myth. How could this be a myth? Isn't it true that when we think of those, those leaders, those high performers, they're self-driven? Don't we hear that all the time? Haven't you ever said to yourself, oh, I just need a bit more motivation? I feel discouraged by my lack of motivation. Look at that person. Look at the energy and enthusiasm they bring to it. Um, and, and it's true. It, going back to instincts, if you're driven by fear, you, you probably don't need to go searching for motivation. But I question whether that's going to get you the ultimate success, whether fear is, is, is the right driver. Because that driver, fear, is feelings-based. And we said mindsets are about thinking. When you think about motivation, you might even ask yourself. So just pause for a moment and look at those two questions. What's more your tendency? If you want to put a context around that, anyone ever set their alarm to get up early in the morning and do some exercise? <laughs> How motivated do you feel? Your duna is like you know, cuddling you, especially if it's a cold winter day. And <laughs> you don't feel like doing it. You don't feel like doing it. So the question is, do you, do you wait? for motivation before taking action, or do you take action even if you don't feel like doing it? What's your tendency? Take a moment, just, just, just share that question with your neighbor. I just want to check in, just a, a quick check in with your neighbor. What's your tendency? Have, have, have a 30-second have a chat, and then I'll, I'll come back to the. <laughs> so basically, when you look at this question, these questions, you, you're going to ask yourself, am I someone driven by feelings, or am I someone driven by you know, my mindset? And, and that's the difference between these two. Feelings are important. Don't get me wrong. I, I like to engage with feelings. But when it comes to high performance, we have to be more discerning. We have to figure out how to manage those feelings better because it's predictable and only human that they're going to disrupt us on that pathway. So if those are the myths, then, then what are the principles? Um, before we jump to the principle, I'd like to just, just make a mental note or maybe on your piece of paper, which, which myth stood out for you? Which one was one that you, you thought, geez, I'd... I've really bought into that in the past. I've got to change that. Or maybe there's something you disagree with. You wholeheartedly say, Sean, nah, -uh, that's not a myth. We really need that strongly to, to achieve. So just, just make a mental note or write it down on your piece of paper which of these uh, myths stood out for you. And now we're going to look at the principles. Um, myths, remember, I've said that they're correlated with success. So there's an element of them that's, that's there. It's, it's in line with success, with high performance, but not necessarily causing it. And in my experience, what causes it, it to something else. And so we go to the, the principles. So myth number one was, uh, was results first as a mindset. The principle number one, behaviors first, then results. So in sport, we talk about the practice of excellence. Get behaviors right, actions right, regardless of short-term poor, poor results. That's difficult to do psychologically. How do you keep working towards something when you're not getting rewarded? Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to get my two-year-old to do that. Um, <laughs> but what we say in sport is the worst outcome for your future success is to go backwards in a win. So you're getting some good results, but they're actually covering up over poor behaviors, backwards in a win. You don't want to get good results when you're, when you're doing things wrong. And that's a question that gets raised in a, a disruptive, changing market because I think our behaviors are constantly changing, too, or they need to adapt. Um, coming back to the story, I said I'd, I'd finish it. I, 
when I, when I worked at the Saints, um, I got hired to work with the players and their off-field issues, support them, deal with their, you know, their personal stuff so that they could show up and play well on game day. But on, the coach didn't really know what to do with me the rest of the time. So he just, Ross told me to sit in, um, in the box on game day. So that's, that's where the, the coaches all sit. Um, I sat in all the meetings, uh, pre-game, halftime, post-game locker room and the review meeting. And he didn't give me a role, just invited me to come and sit in all those things. But I ended up paying attention to his communication as, as a leader of, of this team. Um, and, and remember, we were, we were losing. We were almost last on the ladder back in 2007, and we were losing almost all of the time. And what I noticed in getting caught up in that results mindset was that we, it was very negative. It was a very negative place to be. And, and I was on a probationary contract, and I was looking actually at, at, at leaving the club because it was too depressing. And then a, a, a friend challenged me and said, Sean, if the sports psych's depressed, you guys are really in trouble. <laughs> it's like, sort yourself out. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah, you're right, right, right. I've got to get out of this. So what do I got to do? I was getting caught up in this focus on results. It's, it's easy to. Um, so I had all this information because I'd been taking notes, observing the coach. And I could tell you that it, the, his communication, it wasn't conscious or intentional, but it wasn't working. And so instead of um, you know, quitting my job, I decided to take a risk. I, I walked into his office. I'd written a three-page report giving him feedback on his communication. It was unsolicited. Um, and I, there we go. Um, <laughs> and then I, I walked into his office and said, look, Ross, I'm, I'm sorry. I've been seeing you in the wrong light. I've been getting caught up in, 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 in stuff. I didn't really want to you know, make it too negative. Let's, let's forget all that. Let's start again. Let's talk about what's possible for this team. We could be the best team in the competition. You could be the best coach. If you were the best coach or that was what's possible, you'd, you'd want some feedback. Here it is. And then I thought I'd leave and find out if I still had a job. Um, but he made me sit next to him while he, he read the report. <laughs> it was one of the most nerve-wracking, you know, uh, sort of 10 minutes of my life. And he yelled at me when he finished reading it. <laughs> so why the fuck did it take you so long to give this to me? I'm like... <laughs> Because you scare me? I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, so, but he said, what do we, the next question was, what do we do about it? And I said, turn over the last page. And I'd, I'd written up a model that was really simple, a little bit more than just you know, action equals results or success. It was, we, we got to start with possibility. We can't, we're caught up in probability. So probability is based on past. So you, you know, if you're a statistician, you base your future predictions on the past. So if you're losing all the time, you predict that we'd lose. So our mind's caught up in probability. We've got to step out of that and get into possibility. What's possible for this team? And what actions do you need to take if you're going to fulfill that possibility? I said, we're not a great team yet, but we can take the actions of a great team. It's possible to be that great team. So he took that concept, and he, and he gave the team this incredible talk that week. And, and it was timely because we were playing West Coast, who were the defending premiers. They'd lost one game in 59 on their home ground out in, in, in Subiaco, in Perth. And we were almost last on the ladder. So the probability of success was very low. And his message to the team was, I don't care this weekend whether we win or we lose. I'm going to stand at the race where the players run down after the game. And each one is going to run past me at the end of the game and look me in the eye. All I care about is you can say that you gave 100% effort to these five key behaviors. And there were some basic footies things. We won the game by five points. Ross sent me a text after the game and said, your advice was instrumental in the win. I have written Ross Lyon a report every single week of the footy season for the last eight years since that point. Um, so thinking differently, challenging your thinking, but getting out of this results mindset can be pretty crucial to success. What would I suggest? Um, we could spend a whole day workshopping this, and, I, and I'd love to um, if given the opportunity. But we're going we're gonna to wrap up. I'm going to give you just a, a few key tips. Is, what are you doing to define, measure, and drive behaviors? Have you, you could walk out of here today and say, what are the top you know, five key daily actions that my team could be taking? Are you, are you measuring those behaviors? Are you rewarding them? Because if you're not, and we're only looking at results, we could be moving backwards in, in a few wins and missing out on really what creates long-term success. Principle number two, if talent is a seduction, I'm not going to say talent's still not important. Just like results, it's still important. It gets you in the door. We want to recruit by talent. But effort is what drives excellence. If there's talent, you could be averagely above average. Can I say that? Averagely above average. So someone who's talented gets away with being mediocre for them, but they're better than everyone else. 
How do we get them to be peak performers, to go through the roof? We've got to focus on different things, effort and improvement. Carol Dweck's got a, a great stack of research. You've probably seen her on YouTube. If you haven't, look her up. Talks about effort versus growth mindset. The impact even on children and learning is extraordinary. When we get out of a talent mindset and into an effort, improvement, or growth mindset. What do you need to do around, around your business then? You've got to find ways to reward quality effort. Behavioral science tells us reinforce the things you want to see repeated. We often just reward results. Um, in, in a sales game, in an up market, you reward some of the big bonus for a result, but they may not actually be a good salesperson because the market, it was just like their order taking. We've got to reward quality effort even in a down market. Celebrate results. Principle three, failure is not an option, is the myth. Wow, that's some rain out there. <laughs> Giving up is not an option, is the principle. You gotta check into failure. Um, be prepared for those that are coming. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot of chaos in your, in your industry. Maybe some failures, I don't know, maybe a few setbacks, maybe a few challenges. You gotta check into them. The samurai warrior was, was known in his time as the most fearsome warrior on the planet. Why? Because he meditated on the, the ultimate failure before going into battle, which was his death. Come to an acceptance, I'm gonna die? But then what happens in battle? That fear of failure doesn't hold on to him. He's already, he's let it go. We've got to check into failure. Be prepared is what I say is fail going 100%. Be okay with failure as long as you've done everything you could to succeed. Don't get this one wrong. I had someone at a conference email me after my, my talk and said, what was that thing you said? Uh, be 100% committed to failure? <laughs> you'll, you'll succeed at that, no problem. <laughs> no, don't get this one wrong. Fail going 100%. So what do you need to do in your teams is, is, is leverage failure and create possibilities. So you know, look at, create a failure reflection process. Not every single little failure you need to address. Some of them just suck. Just let them go, you know, whatever. But analyze the important ones through a lens of possibility. I like to use a scientific mindset, observe. Observe, what did I observe? This is what went wrong, objectively. You know, and why I believe it went wrong, hypothesize. And then focus on adapting your behaviors, your actions next time. Look at opportunities created from this failure and ultimately spend some time looking at what is possible for the future if you get this right. Not stepping into probability. Myth number four was show no sign of weakness. Look, pretending everything is awesome when it's not is only gonna last so long. And I think you know, in our marketplace with social engagement, we actually are attracted to those who show, who are transparent with vulnerability. And like, we gotta be careful with this. We can't look weak, too weak to our consumers and to our marketplaces and certainly not to our competitors. But there's, a, there's an element of human, humanness. And I think social media has blown this wide open where we love the stories of what I'd call vulnerability turnaround. Someone who says, who's been in a tough place but shows how they had the courage to admit that, stepped out of it and succeeded. One of my business associates uh, back in Canada actually lived as a homeless heroin addict for seven years, the late teens and early 20s. The quintessential guy pushing a shopping cart around, collecting cans and sleeping under bridges. You know, he had to actually admit to his, his vulnerabilities. His story is very powerful when people tell it because he actually got out of that and became the CEO of his own little tech company. Made his first million in sales by the time he was 33 years old. Like an extraordinary story of possibility and turnaround. People relate to that vulnerability. But even in your workplace, if you're talking about building your team, in the athlete sense, it's, it's not trying to hide an injury or pretend that you're tough, or, or certainly on a mental perspective, pretend that you've got the mental toughness when you're struggling. I got an expression around this one, it's called weak is tough. It's tougher to admit that you're struggling than just to brush off, say everything's fine when someone asks you that question. But once again, we, we wanna, we want to acknowledge that. We want to make it okay to say, I don't know, I'm struggling. Now there's a little caveat to this one so you don't create a whinging culture, which is say, I don't know, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes to sort this out. So that it's, it's vulnerability plus commitment to change is, is what creates real mental toughness. I mean, look, I, I, I was reading about Kodak the other day. I didn't know it, but one of its own engineers developed the first digital camera. <laughs> but they only wanted to focus on their strengths, not their weaknesses. And I would say, in their case, probably a weakness 
was the failure to innovate, really. They didn't want to, you know, <laughs> and they, they monopolized the print, photography, film market. So much. they were caught up in results, weren't they? Instead of going, well, what could be our weakness? How'd that work out for them? <laughs> so what do we need to do? Find ways to ritualize courage in your team, in your life. You know, celebrate those vulnerability turnarounds. Make it okay to say, I don't know, but then follow through and find out how someone has actually turned that around. You know, work through a personal issue, work through a team issue, work through a weakness, and how to win from it. Celebrate courage if you want to make it part of your culture. And that last one, I would say, um, and, and we're getting close to an end here, that last one was uh, don't need motivating. And I know that some people are like, no, 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 I, I don't agree with that. And a lot of people disagree with that. But fundamentally, it's because we don't actually understand what motivation is. Well, at least not in my world. Um, Motivation is a feeling, it's an emotion. Yes, if you feel fear, you'll be motivated. But remember that, that morning you woke up for the gym, you didn't feel motivated, but you still went to the gym? How do you feel after you finished your workout? The endorphins are pumping through your body, you, you feel great. And now you're like, no, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and go to the gym again because it feels so good now. Now you're motivated, it's a feeling. But if you're, if you're waiting for motivation to try to achieve high performance, you could be waiting a long time. So motivation is not really what drives action. In the absence of fear, we need inspiration or purpose. That's the thinking brain, creative, creative brain. A big why. Because remember the, the conservation of energy? Con complacency, conserving energy, is just biochemistry. We need to find ways to constantly connect to purpose. You have to choose high performance. And if you're leading a team, you have to get them to choose high performance, not a demand. Remember, there's lazy is normal. There's nothing wrong with them. So how can you get people to choose high performance? Well, you've got to get them to buy in. You've got to crank up the inspiration. Find ways to get them to see the bigger why. I'm not the first one to say this. You know, a lot of people have watched Simon Sinek do very well telling the story of put why first. Explore the deeper why. And, and if you're in a large organization, be okay with your frontline staff not buying into the big why of the organization necessarily. Your job is not necessarily to get everyone saying that they want the same purpose as the organization, but help them connect their own personal why, their own personal purpose. How doing good at my job is actually going to serve the business's big why. You make that connection, people get inspired. You know, so I, I, I like things like, how do you do this? Well, write a press release. You know, write down you know, big reasons why. Get people excited. Script a, be a coach. Script a 10-minute talk to give your team that inspiring talk. Give it to yourself in the mirror if you need a little bit of inspiration. And if you can't do it yourself, get around people that can. So look, these are, these are uh, principles. We've looked at some myths. Uh, we could, I'd, I'd love to workshop this stuff all day long. Um, but we're coming to a close. And, and hopefully, you've been able to, to pick up a few little nuggets out of, out of these. For me, what I find is that when we Today and in the future, if we get caught up in the feeling brain, which is really normal and human, um, particularly when facing challenge and disruption, the brain is really, really, really struggles on uncertainty. In the survival world, uncertainty is one of the biggest threats because you don't know how to respond and survive. It's going to be tough when you get caught up in, the, in that, that feeling brain. Um, so our challenge is, is to step outside of that, to choose to think and do differently, maybe apply couple of core concepts. Just take one of them and run with it for a little while. Be more discerning about the meaning you make of results, particularly failure. Be more discerning about feeling and stay focused on action. Be okay with failure as long as you've done everything you could to succeed. And ultimately, um, my favorite one in terms of mindset is just remember that anything is possible and drive your teams to do the same. Thank you very much.